Hello and welcome. I'm here with Alex Lomquist. He's my guest today and I'm very pleased to have you. Hi, Alex. How are you doing? Hey, how's it going, man? I'm doing awesome. Thank you for having me on. I've been looking forward to it. Hey, uh, me as well. I was really impressed by your voice, uh, as I've already told you before. Uh, it sounds really great. Now you've even turned on the great microphone, so really mm -hmm. happy to what's going to happen here. So just about your name, I, I asked you before, like Alex Longquist, uh, what's your background? Yes, so I live here in the United States, but I do have a history of Northern European heritage. Uh, several, several years ago, uh, my great, great grandfather came from Sweden and he settled up in Northern Oregon, uh, like Birkenfeld, which is like an extremely tiny town there that like maybe like 15, 20 people live there right now. And uh, he got a plot of land and started a tree farm and just like started logging in this area. And so all of my roots go back to Oregon. And uh, yeah, just got that, that Swedish last name, blonde, blue, blue eyed, you know, you know the deal. <laughs> <laughs> yep. uh, so this was three generations ago, right? E four. Four even. Four. four. Yeah. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. Yeah, and yeah. most of my most of my bloodline though is actually like French German. I did the 23 and me, but my my name that carried on is Swedish. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. So did like the Swedish they also have like a, had like a thing with Germany, right? So they they settled across borders and stuff like that or No, no, that I think that was my mom's side had okay. German like French German and then they my dad's side they just met. In but French States. German is also not very common, right? So was this like the Alsace region or something like that? Uh, honestly, I don't know all the specifics. I'm just going off of what my my gene test said. It's just like they grouped them together because yeah. they're close enough geographically, I think. Great stuff. Yeah. I always yeah. also wanted to do like this um, this test because I found it peculiar. Uh, like my um, roots are in uh, the Balkan Peninsula, so I when I was born in Serbia, and Serbia was occupied by um, the uh, Turkish people for a very long time. So I'm guessing I'm somewhat Turkish, but I don't look that Turkish. I I think, uh, and many people also tell me that like I, I look a little bit different than other people from my country, and I feel strangely attracted to like um, the French type of um, women. You know, there's like this, this mm -hmm. chart where you can pick out uh, which person you're most attracted to. Mm -hmm. And that should be like your gene pool or gene material. They, they did like these studies, I think, 15 years ago or something. And I strangely always picked like the, the, the French ones. Yeah. So, so like uh, the hopeless romantics who are smoking cigarettes, is that it? No, like, no, 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 no. Just, just like, you know, facial features, ah, bones, stuff like that. Um, they gotcha. did um, these phantom faces. So they did like measurements of all the people from, from uh, the country. Uh, so they would like find uh, the commonalities and then they did a phantom face that was just like the average of all the points. And then you get like this bland, neutral uh, face of that country. And I found it really peculiar because apparently the Slavs and the Franks, so I should be like of Slavic heritage, Slavs and Franks lived next to each other um, somewhere. I think it was uh, uh, Czechia or something in this period. And then they walked all over the place. Yeah, so. Uh, That's interesting. I'm curious. I want to know what, what mine would be. I think I know. Def Latinas. Really? Latinas. Yeah, <laughs> I got to be honest. <laughs> okay. So. <laughs> I do have a question for you about about like, I've never been to Europe, so it's very interesting to me, like how everything's integrated, like the <laughs> language and all that stuff. You live in Switzerland now, right? Yeah. Right. So, so I looked up the the languages in Switzerland, yeah. and it's 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 it was surprising to me because it's like Italian, German, French, and then Romanche, which is like yeah. an extreme. Do you know what what is that? Can you tell me what that is? Yeah, yeah. So this is um, Switzerland is very special in the regard that um, it has a lot of mountains. So there's a lot of valleys and a lot of small parts that aren't actually belonging um, to any part there. 
There's actually a fifth language, or you can call it just like a very, very thick dialect, which is the Swiss German, uh, which is very different from the actual German. So Germans usually don't understand it when we speak it. Um, so that you could call that like the, the fifth language, but like the official languages are the four. So you have like the French part um, that's very near France and you have the German part that's that's like Germany, Austria, but there's also Italian and this is just one canton. So it's like one of the 26th um, in Switzerland. They speak Italian. They have like Italian as their main language. And it's also spoken a little bit in other valleys and uh, Rumansh or uh, Retoroman or uh, there are also some other um, terms for it. It's actually a Romanic language that is spoken in very high mountains, valleys. It's called uh, Grison, uh, the canton. And it's also next to Italy and they have been like kind of secluded. I have no idea how to, I know just a few words from there. For example, like Lushaina would be a uh, nightingale or something like that. But uh, it's a very weird language. And, mm. <laughs> but it's a Romantic language, like Italian, Spanish, uh, f French, uh, Portuguese. It belongs to the same family. It just sounds very different to my ears. Oh, well, that's interesting. That's and, cool. In, in general, like like in Europe, I think uh, the question that you asked how how the stuff is handled, I've met actually I was in Grison and I met a couple of American tourists there while I was giving concerts, uh, and they just told me that they were amazed of how much cultural heritage uh, there is in Europe because uh, for many people in the U.S. they they just like have these 300 something years uh, they go back. Uh, or maybe, yeah, let's let's say 400, maybe. I don't know if there are any older buildings than that. And in Europe, you have like these cathedrals that are more than a thousand years old. And um, it's a whole different time frame and it has this weight to it. So yeah. definitely recommend visiting. Uh, just ring me up. When you I, yeah, for sure. Where should I go first when I when I get there? It depends on what do you want to do. Do you like want to do nature? Do you want to do culture? Do you want to do like high culture? Do you want to do Ooh. like early culture? Um, Ooh, good question. I think I think seeing a lot of the the old cathedrals and like the the old religious like the really impressive religious buildings that are really really old and impressive would probably be a, a priority for me. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. So I could recommend Italy for that uh, because you have also like the Roman ruins that you can uh, see in many places, but you also have these huge cathedrals. And also I was impressed by, by the UK. Uh, I was in England and Scotland shortly, and they have also just a lot of these cathedrals. I think it's 30 or 40 or 50. And they're just huge and, and amazing. Um, but these are from a different time. These are either very modern like 19th century or middle ages like uh, 900 thousand thousand one hundred something like that mm -hmm. when you're performing like because you're a classical music yeah performer, right do you get to perform in any any like crazy old buildings like really impressive architecture and stuff like that uh yeah it depends uh but there are a couple of them that I wish to perform in, like these really huge, amazing places, but they're super hard to get into. So there's a lot of gatekeeping uh, and you have to know the guy who knows a guy who knows a guy to even just like get in. And it's just very few organists, for example, that get invited to go there. If you're like part of an ensemble, it's it's a little bit easier. I have been playing in, in a couple places also that have um, impressed me a lot and what I like the most are like the original instruments so when they're instruments that are three four hundred years old um, they have been restored but there's a completely new game like you can't compare it to anything that we have today it's, it's a different language it's a different sound and I really love it like I, I love the the stuff that's been written 300 years ago that's cool yeah I can't even imagine what that would feel like to get your hands on something like that that's awesome it's it's great yeah. stuff thanks also for asking questions but we yeah. are here to get to know you so um, i'm talking yeah. <laughs> we're gonna put on some some focus on this great guy here 
So what I really was curious about was what was your um, like you growing up and how did you choose um, to go your do your profession? What are you doing? Like like what were those major decisions in your life that shaped the path where you're today? Yeah. So when I was young, like in in grade school, I had a lot of health problems. I was a really poorly behaved kid, not because I like wanted to, I just didn't feel very good. And I, I kind of uh, was very loud. I was unable to control myself on the playground with just so much excitement, you know, like just all over unhinged with the other kids. And I think that kind of rubbed my teachers the wrong way. I mean, they, I was a good kid, but like they didn't know how to keep me integrated in a sort of appropriate re- appropriate way for school right so um i feel like I, I got this message over and over again that there was this there was something wrong with me you know and when you're a kid you know what this work this this entire work that we've been learning with julian entails is like you you internalize everything that you hear when you're a child because you're reliant on other people for your own survival so you're egocentric you internalize everything So I think that really took a hit on my self-esteem and I wasn't really feeling very well physically Mm -hmm. at the same time. So it was just a real load on me for a while. And as I got older through middle school and through high school, I really started suffering from a lot of different chronic illnesses like chronic fatigue syndrome, multiple chemical sensitivity, which is basically extreme sensitivity to certain scents and chemicals like scented soaps, deodorants, cleaning agents, like oh, basically yeah. anywhere that I went that had a strong uh, artificial or like industrial scent would send me into massive headache, like need to go lie down and take a nap immediately. Otherwise I just wouldn't be able to function. Oh my God. I, I haven't ever yeah. that this existed. It's, it's crazy. Yeah. And I had fibromyalgia. I had neuropathy pain in my legs and pelvis. Like my body was literally falling apart and I wasn't even 20 years old. And okay. oh my God, yeah. can, can you just like uh, clarify? So you were actually yeah. a good kid, right? Um, you were just a little bit unhinged on the playground and the teachers were just afraid that you might do something to hurt the other kids or you were just like, like not calibrated. Uh, what happened there? I had a lot of energy despite yeah. me not feeling very good. Um, physically, I guess you could say. And my parents put me in performing arts because I was like very vocal. You know, we talk about my voice. Like I have a performer's voice. I love acting and theater. And so they put me into choir. They put me into performing arts and I really thrived in it. Like I loved it. It was a nice outlet for me to do those things. Um, but as far as me being able to like control my behavior with the other kids and in the classroom, and even at home for that matter, like it was difficult. And I think I, I had like ADHD, AD, like OCD, like whatever whatever uh, mental illness you wanna throw on there. I, I never got diagnosed, but yeah, I definitely had something along those lines. Um, so I kept moving along, trying to figure out what the issue was. I, mean, I was feeling like shit all the time in high school. And then I went to college, enrolled at university, and it continued to get worse. And I went to every doctor, every specialist. None of them had any answers for me. My testosterone was in in the in the tank, but they're like, oh, it's just barely on the like the bottom of the normal range. So you're okay. There's like nothing we can do for you. My whole body was in in serious small small fiber neuropathy pain, which is like you get pain on your fingertips and toes. Um, I had pain in my pelvis. It was just like, it was horrible. And I knew it was nutrition related. I knew there was something going on with my digestion, Mm -hmm. Um, but I just didn't know exactly what to do. I kept trying different things. I eliminated gluten, I eliminated dairy, and some of it helped, but it really didn't fix the whole deal. So, How did you find out? Like you said, you knew it was nutrition related. So you 
you had this problem for a very long time, right? And then you went to all the specialists like doctors and people who should know what's going on, but they couldn't really help you with it. And mm -hmm. so your body like told you, listen, there's something that's going on and I feel it's nutrition related. Is that how I understood it? So, so as I was saying, I knew it was nutrition related because my digestion was not good. I, I had, my stools were horrible. I was not keeping down food. I couldn't digest any fat. So like, even if I had a sip of like homemade chicken broth, I would need to run to the bathroom within like 30 seconds. It was that bad. Oh my and, God. Yeah. So, so I knew something was up. I kept trying stuff. My poor mother was helping me out as much as she could doing research and, and also cooking food for me, but like it, it felt like nothing was working. And during my senior year at university, I had to drop out because it got so bad. Like I couldn't, I couldn't get through a, a day at, at university with my classes, with my homework, and then just managing my symptoms. And I ended up working with a nutritionist who was in uh, my hometown at the time where I was going to uni. And like the, f the first time I met her, it was like she had an answer for every single thing that I was experiencing. It was like, it was like divine intervention. I, I, I can't tell you how in awe I was at this person's knowledge. And her name's Mary. She's now my mentor who I'm, I'm working for in the nutrition space because I started working with her. I started improving and I got into remission from everything just by changing my diet and changing my lifestyle. And I was like, what the fuck? Like, why are people not talking about this more? So I switched up the career that I was doing. I was studying business administration and I finished, I, I re-enrolled or got back into school, finished my degree. And then I was like, I'm studying nutrition. Like this is my purpose now. So now, uh, now I work as a nutritionist focusing with people who have similar conditions as me, chronic fatigue syndrome, nervous system conditions like dysautonomia, neuropathy, fibromyalgia. And uh, yeah, so so here here we are today. That's my story. Great stuff. I, I have a, a few yeah. questions. So um, I can't even imagine how that must have felt like, you know, you uh, feeling this way and then still going to uni and, and trying to work and function through the day. So was that like a fight against your own body or did you like just try to do the best out of every situation? Um, how did this feel like? Yeah, it was actually a lot of denial and stuffing things down because I was trying so hard to integrate myself into the typical college life. You know, all I wanted to do is just have a, a normal college person, college student's life, you know, go to parties on Friday and Saturday, drink a bunch, be hung over the next day, go play basketball at the rec center, and then do your homework last minute, like all this stuff, right? I couldn't do any of that. And, and when I did, I would, I would do it and be totally ignoring the signals and the symptoms for my body, which just made it way worse. So I was literally like driving myself into the ground, so to speak pushing myself to do this stuff. And it just continued to get worse because I, I was like, I was in complete denial. And I think that that's, that's what made it so painful. And it all came to a head at the end when I was almost done with school. It was like, holy shit, I have just been completely ignoring everything that's going on inside of me. And, you know, like, like I touched on at the beginning, I did have low self-esteem. I did have anxiety. I did have the split between the acceptable parts of me and the unacceptable parts of me, which I'm certain like actually contributed to my physical health in a huge way. But I knew that the, the nutrition piece like needed to be addressed. And that's what you know, the information unfolded to me in a way at that time where it was like, okay, this is what I'm going to work on. And ever since then, since I graduated, since I got into remission, most of my work and attention has been more on the subconscious stuff, the mental reprogramming, letting go. And over the last year, since I've started diving into Julian's work and doing a lot more of that stuff, I've seen more progress in, in that area of my life than like 
all of these other years I've been trying this stuff out. So it's been remarkable. I've been learning a lot of new lessons along the way and like just becoming the most confident, loving person that I can be. Like, it's just, it's just the most fulfilling, rewarding work I could ask for. So it's been, it's been a, a crazy, like five or six years for me. Uh, a lot of transformation. Kind of amazing, though. It's really amazing. Like all yeah these changes and and uh, i mean you're probably still going through changes and and everything's getting even stronger and uh even more intense as as it's happening uh, i think i can relate somewhat uh to what you said i haven't had like that strong symptoms but uh when i got covid for the first time this was over a year ago um yeah maybe a year and a half i really got a lot of joint and muscle pains especially in my legs and, and lower back and it took a long while just to get rid of those um i tried to stuff them away also during the day uh, tried to do other things that would work but at night when i went to sleep everything would just like come back up tenfold and and just hurt everywhere and then i couldn't sleep and then next morning i couldn't wake up properly and it was just like this vicious cycle of of getting worse and worse and um yeah, I mean, for me, the first part was exercise that also helped me. Um, I love to go for walks, but with these uh, muscle pains that I had them, uh, I couldn't go for walks. Like it would literally get worse after walking, uh, which really also discouraged me. And at that point, uh, what helped me a lot was uh, trauma work also with my coach um, that I did with her. I did it with her for a long time but then i went to her with these specific symptoms because i also didn't see her uh, a lot during covid and she helped me a lot um, and i also realized that probably these things are somewhat trauma related it's not just the body it's it's this connection between the mind and our being and the body and everything is just correlating Later, I got COVID again, and then um, I had some digest digestion stuff. Right now, I stopped drinking alcohol completely. Um, I did stop smoking uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, I did uh, change. Like right now, I'm even uh, turned out all the sugars out of my diet. Uh, nice. uh, yeah. it's, it's, it's been changing. And I mean, as I am evolving, like mentally, uh, it's also the body that's evolving. So it's somewhat of a similar path i would say from what i've yeah. heard yeah cool man that's that's awesome that you're you're making those changes covid really threw a wrench in a lot of people's lives in a, just an enormous way like people people who are on the edge as i like to describe it with their health are like basically walking the edge of a cliff and then they get covid and it just knocks them off the cliff yeah it just completely un unearths everything that's going on in their life and what's what's actually been really common, and this is a condition that I, I work with um, very often now in my own practice, is long COVID or dysautonomia. So like they're usually quite related. Dysautonomia is the dysfunction or the dysregulation of the autonomic nervous system. So the okay. autonomic <laughs> nervous system, your, your, your brain controls whether you're in fight or flight or rest and digest, basically. You like flip back and forth between those. And so if your nervous system is completely fucked, there's no regulation in it, right? You basically can't, your body can't operate. Like, cause you know how much your subconscious does for you on its own without you having to think about it, right? It's yeah. everything, it's everything. Your heartbeat, your, your digestive juices, your bile, your enzymes, like all of that just goes completely out the window. Your circadian rhythm dictates a lot of that. And so one of the most important pieces to recovering from this condition is being so strict and so regimented with your routine, like waking up at the same time every day, no matter how much sleep you got, going outside, getting sunlight in your eyes to set your circadian rhythm, because you have little sensors in your eyes that turn on different, you know, mm -hmm. metabolisms and physiologies in your body. And then exercising at the same time every day, eating at the same time every day, you've got to be so strict. And then also these people who are on the edge with their health, it's because they're extremely stressed and running their body into the ground, much like I was 
but they've also got extreme levels of toxicity in their body from poor diet, from their microbiome and their guts being messed up. And so you've got to make like radical changes in so many ways to lower your stress, to detoxify and to heal your gut so you can actually absorb the food um, that you're eating. So, so what yeah. was the name of the condition that you described? Dysautonomia. Dysautonomia. Yes. And, and yes. does maybe also have um, some kind of hypersensitivity of the senses or hypersensitivity of uh, to different substances to it? So is are you asking about multiple chemical sensitivity that I mentioned earlier? Is no, no, no. I'm, I'm just asking because I know a couple of acquaintances and friends who also have like long COVID symptoms that go in this direction. Um, they are hypersensitive to sounds or to light. Oh, yes. Or to, so it's it's like the same. It goes to it's the, the. It's actually the same cause. So what that is 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 limbic system hypervigilance. Your limbic system is the emotional mammalian part of your brain. It's like the amygdala, uh, the hypothalamus, right? That middle middle part of your brain. That part of your brain is responsible for all of your sensory inputs. So all of your five senses. So if you if you have trauma in your life or you get really sick all of a sudden and your body's not serving you, your limbic system can get so on edge in an effort to protect you. So it's actually a, a brilliant survival mechanism to help keep you alive and keep you safe. But in the real world, it's not very fun because things are loud, things are smelly, like everything comes up um, and it can send you over. So that was actually a huge piece for me in overcoming the chemical sensitivity because my like the sense the sensing or the 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 scent part of my brain was just so overdeveloped that any time i smelled a chemical it would it would alert my brain that i was in immediate danger and it would send me into like panic mode and needing to lie down so this is the same thing for these for these people If you want me to let you, I can send you some information to share with them. It's yeah, definitely. Please, uh, yeah. please do. I would, uh, I would love to forward it to them because I know a couple of them have been really fighting with it uh, for a very long time, and it would just be great uh, to have another perspective and yeah. uh, so a little bit of hope. Let me guess, meditation would be probably helpful in this case. Oh sure, yeah, meditation, meditation for anyone i think it, everyone should be doing meditation and if everyone was meditating the world would be so different people would be less stressed they would be way healthier there would be less conflict i mean it just but specifically for for these conditions absolutely like it because it it trains the brain to be less in fear and fight or flight mode mm -hmm. and more present People in the Western world have such a difficult time being present, like surrendering to the present moment. And I mean, we're seeing we're seeing the results of that in our own health because we're feeling guilty about the past. We're feeling fearful about the future. And it's as Eckhart Tolle says, it's insane. Like it's literally insane to do that. It's easy to fall into that trap. But if you're doing that, you never actually live. You're never enjoying life ever at any point in time. Yeah, I mean, I think this is the pitfall. I was one of those who thought that meditation was just really a waste of time. You know, um, I thought that in this time I'm actually doing nothing um, that's in any way productive. And it's also not bringing me any joy like that I could feel if I would be, let's say, be watching Family Guy or something. So why on earth would I meditate? I still made me do it every morning. I would like light up a candle and I would like look into the flame for five minutes and just really hard try to focus. But it was everything. Yeah, it was it was all like uh, uh, achievement, right. achievement, achievement. Let's let's do it um, until it got to a point where it was unbearable. Like my, my mind was full with stuff all the time. Compared to when I was a child, I remember I would have a lot of contemplative moments, just like hanging around, doing nothing, just observing, not thinking, not just being a happy kid, you know? Mm -hmm. Yeah. 
yeah, I think, I think if we, if we taught children how to meditate like that, that would be the most impactful thing that we could do on the world. I think like that would be the, the easiest way to just it, elevating our level of consciousness, right? Like that's, that's my fundamental goal and purpose in this world, whether that be through helping people with nutrition, helping people with their self-esteem now with this work with Julian. Um, and we can do that through meditation, but, um, you know, all we can do is, is try and spread the word as much as we can. And also like recognize that we can't take responsibility for everyone is huge too. Like as a coach, I don't, I don't know if you've thought about this, but like feeling a responsibility to like save everyone. I feel like I've had to let that go, especially people that come into my life. Like they're telling me about their problems and I have, I want to give them answers. I'm like, Oh my God, you just do this, 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 but I have to be like, no, they don't want to listen to me. Like they're, you have to let them figure it out and come to you. Otherwise they're just going to be like, Oh, whatever, you know, or yeah. they'll be mad at you. You know, you just gotta be okay with whatever they want to do. Yeah. I, I had this discussion actually with my mom um, a couple of weeks ago and I really enjoyed um, the, the mental sparring with it because uh, she argued that whenever you see someone in need and you have more experience, you definitely should go and tell them, don't do this or, or do this instead, or just offer your expertise. So they will take it, uh, to which I responded, I did this, you know, for most of my life and it doesn't work. And the reason that it doesn't work is not just the ego and that they are maybe a little bit insulted or they, they want to do like their, th their own thing, or they think maybe that you're manipulating them or trying to sell them something or whatever. But actually, I think it's much higher than that. I think every one of us has like this own path to take, right? And if I'm offering solutions to someone, I'm robbing them of their own possibility to make decisions. I'm actually taking away their freedom because I'm forcing any kind of belief onto them uh, just by saying you should do this. It's a complete disregard of that person and of their situation and of everything. It's just like assuming that I have the solution and I just tell them this is the exact way that you need to go. And if you don't do it, you will never ever find happiness in your life um it's a little bit presumptuous don't you think yeah i think i think you're onto something if you can just kindly offer them information or just mention something that worked for you that's probably as far as you should push it unless they're actually asking you for your advice in which case you can go in as full as you want to but it's been really difficult for me to do that, you know, every time when people come to me and talk to me about their problems, you know, they've got to be openly receptive for it to actually be productive. Mm -hmm. Yeah. But, but uh, have you had the experience that maybe this receptivity changes um, throughout the relationship that you have with them? So let's say someone comes to you and, and, and explains a problem. Um, there's a couple of different roles that you can take. And let's say you, you take the role of the coach who is above them. So that's maybe let's say a, a teacher or a figure um, that can offer knowledge or can offer something. Um, then you can offer this knowledge. As, as you said, you can say, look, I did this and this and this and it worked for me. Um, but then at that point, you're not really the coach. You are leveling with them. So you're more like um, this friend or, or just this um, person uh, that's at eye level talking to them. Look, I had this experience, like I'm sharing experience of my life. And if you move to the place above, you're, you're talking down to them what they should or shouldn't do. Um, and there you already have the ego involved. So I think every time that we are not really on, on eye level and communicating with, with each other, um, it's really hard to make a point. It's really hard to make it stick. And even if it sticks, usually they have a problem with themselves. 
um, they don't believe in themselves, so they take your advice over their own internal feeling or or whatever, you know. So it's um, I think it's a very complicated and and very delicate matter. Yes, yes. What did Julian say about this? Why they don't buy or pull the trigger? It's they don't trust you, they don't trust the process, and they don't trust themselves. Yeah. Yes. So if you if you can address all of those, you have a better chance of of helping people. Um, I I feel like I've I've come to a, a, a nice place with this idea where I just put the information out there on social media, on YouTube, whatever. And it's going to hit the people who want the help, who have hit their rock bottom, who are in desperation mode, um, trying to figure things out. And if I can be that person for them, then I'm, a, I'm happy to do that. Um, I'm not here to save everyone, you know, as, as you know, you or any other coach shouldn't necessarily be as well. Yeah. I don't think we can, but what I really think we can, and um, I haven't talked about it yet, but this is like the next uh, next step that I uh, wanted to say is we can offer a lot by just listening. Um, mm-hmm. So even if somebody comes with their problems, sometimes they, they don't need advice. Sometimes they don't need um, any kind of direction. Sometimes they just want to unburden or just to be heard. And I think... This one is maybe probably one of the rarest things that we can offer to each other is really this listening. And that's why it's so important that it's like the central part of the Transformation Mastery Life program. Um, I I think uh, maybe I don't know if, if you remember this, but I asked, like, what's the most important part of the program? And uh, what do you think? is like the craziest exercise or whatever like what's what's the what's the pinnacle of, of all of it of the of the whole live event like the yeah. framework of it? yeah Ooh, yeah good question mm. what's coming to mind is the death meditation yeah i think yeah, yeah. because because it's such a it's such a hack to getting at your subconscious mm-hmm. and the information that I got when I did the death meditation for the first time was so vivid and profound. And it also inspired me to take immediate action. And I feel like that's not unique to me. Like that's going to be really, really the case for a lot of people who do this. And if, you know, if, if we actually, recognize that time is really valuable and it's important to take action and do this work because not only for ourselves but for other people in our lives like we we can create the most beautiful lives for ourselves and others it's just it's it's was so powerful for me and i'm just so amazed as i continue to do this work how awesome life is like even through the suffering, even through like being in such shit, feeling feeling guilt or feeling apathy, whatever. Like Julian says, you've got to fall in love with the the hard or the bad times just as much as the good times because that's just what life is. That's the reality of life. You cannot avoid that stuff. So yeah. embrace it and then take the take the action, do the work and uh, let go and forgive. I mean, it's just, it's so remarkable to me. Anyway, I'm kind of geeking out a little bit here, but it's, it's awesome because I mean, it's really, really a very intense experience. And it, it was the same for me. Like I, I had basically really same opinion, just as you described right now. Uh, but then what I did was uh, line out the whole event. You know, I just, just write the structure really get a top-down view and I was like this is insanely symmetrical and it reminded me of uh, like structures of compositions or structures of architecture that has been used in the Baroque time and Renaissance and stuff like that so this is all built on 
old even old Greek rhetorics and how do you build everything, uh, a lot of numbers, a lot of symbolisms. And usually, let's also say, for example, compositions by Bach, you have a distinct number of movements and then the most important movement would be the one in the middle, right? Uh, so um, I even asked... Not, not by know, mistake, right? That's yeah. That's got to be... Yeah. And it's not. And it's not. It's not the death meditation that's in the middle. Oh, it's not. And, no, it's not. And and this is like the best, uh, the best thing about it. Because have you ever done the live event yourself? I have like, not. Have you participated... Me neither, but um, I asked a friend who did, and I asked him, what was the most intense moment for you at the live event? Like, w what was the most memorable part? Uh, and it was the exercise after the death meditation. It was the sharing, and this one's in the middle. There we go. And... There we go. Uh, regard in regard to what we talked before, like the listening part, the offering of undivided attention, and the offering of complete acceptance, and having been through all of that, I think that is why it's the high point of of everything. And um, for me, like when I realized this, it was mind blowing. I mean, really, <laughs> I, I felt like Sherlock Holmes, you know, going on to something because I haven't um, actually uh, done the live event myself with other people. Uh, but this was just this was just crazy. Just realizing it. And, and yeah. um, now I can't wait to go through it with other people like really. Yes. Yeah. Yeah, I, I think there's nothing more fulfilling to me than getting to see people transform their lives and you just having even just a tiny part in that, you know, it's just, it's the most beautiful thing. I, I, I wouldn't want to be doing anything else. Maybe, maybe, you know, being a performer and being on stage, you get in that, that aligned state when you're just, boom, you're just nailing it. Like that feels pretty good. But um, to me, like seeing seeing people just transform their lives nothing better nothing better and how do you feel when 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 you experience that hmm. it it reminds me that my purpose is extremely important and it gives me so much joy to see that I've helped someone feel better, whether that be physically, mentally, or emotionally. Like I just, I just feel fuzzy and, and light and joyful in my heart and my heart's just like, you know, <laughs> it's, it's the best feeling ever. I don't know, man. Like, the brightest smile. Yeah. yeah. It's, it's so, it's so wonderful. And I mean, I'm, I'm mostly just doing it over Zoom, over a screen, and I can still feel the energy through the screen, but getting to do this at the live events, I think will be, will be just as, just as fulfilling, if not better, because I actually get to be with those people in person. So I'm, I'm really excited about it. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's interesting. I, I feel really differently, actually. Um, I, I don't feel any kind of uncontrolled uh, large happiness or, or anything. Um, like even even when I'm making music, I always try to to do it in a way so people will uh, transform in a way. Uh, maybe they they come inside and I will build like a program that um, takes them on a journey, uh, explores a little bit of sadness of of maybe anger, frustration, depression, um, the negative emotions, and then slowly pick them up and, and raise the energy towards the end of the concert. Uh, and there are also moments like when people cry, where, where people are extremely touched. Um, and I'm just, I feel like a vessel at these moments. I don't feel like I'm really doing 
much or contributing much. Like I, I, it's been strange for me because I always thought that I would be extremely happy or I would feel great or I would feel better about it by doing it, but it's just me enjoying the process. Uh, but I, I think I'm so focused on the process that I don't really even, it's not a non-reactive way, but I, I don't really react if they find it was the, the best thing ever or if they're like, I don't mm. care, I'm gonna go home. I mean, I'm grateful if they if they come to me and, and tell me, wow, this was extremely beautiful or touching, or I did a, a meditation concert not so long ago where I just had people lie down and um, meditate in, in the meanwhile, and I will build up on these, like I, with even with guided meditations, I'm going to go into that and, and just practice myself uh, how to do those um, and create musical type of events uh, that go into this kind of work. I'm super inspired to do all of that. But um, it's it's a really strange feeling that I'm I'm feeling. It's it's just like I'm doing the right thing, uh, but it doesn't it doesn't spike me. It's it's just like remains <laughs> steady. It doesn't elevate mm -hmm. to like uh, extreme highs or 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 lows, which was interesting. So you you mentioned the word vessel. Do you feel like you're you're just a vessel, or like your your purpose is just to help people? experience the human experience through art and music and that and it doesn't really impact you while you're doing it in the same way as the people who are experiencing the performance in a way yeah it, it never impacts me in the same way uh because i'm just in a different uh perspective than they are right um so i'm still having the process of controlling everything and um just being uh, the one that's that's doing things, but I've always strived to like get the message from somewhere else, or or not be the one creating the stuff, because that's like where true power comes from. I think when it's me being played, let's let's uh, say it in th this way, where I don't have to do anything, but it's just being done. And I'm somewhat witnessing it, so I also have like clarity of head and um, yeah, it's just everything is in control, everything is fine, everything is um, more or less the way it's supposed to be, but there, then there are also beautiful things happening um, that can even surprise myself and, and I even start to enjoy it in a way, but I'm certain it's a very different kind of enjoying um, than other people. Uh, when they're there because um, the concerts I enjoy most are the ones that I play and not the ones that I listen to. So <laughs> I think it's a, a difference, um, difference in the vibe, I think. I don't know. Do you think that other musicians that are in the same space as you would agree or um, share similar feelings to you about being a performer? Because I'll say, as as someone who had a history of, you know, performing arts when I was much younger, I would get so much enjoyment from the reactions from the audience. Like I would really be paying attention to the audience and how they were responding and reacting to what I was doing on stage, and that like immediately impacted my emotional state and how I was actually performing. Would you say that's is that like? Do other people I, feel the same? What do you think? Yeah, I think it's very different uh, from from what I am feeling, and uh, definitely like from my colleague performers, uh, I know that there are a lot of different perspectives, um, and I know that there are a lot of different ways on how to do it or or how to uh, how to work with it, even how to work with audiences. There are people who are playing just like with. Um, well, let's call it just a just a piece of glass between them and and others. There are people who who are very uh, demonstrative of their own ability and and exaggerating everything. And I think this is also why it resonates so much with what Julian is uh, teaching um, and talking about is this this authenticity, like the something that that has just found the way. To, to express itself in me 
but it's still me. It's it's like maybe it, it comes from somewhere else. Maybe it's it's a different idea. It's a composition of someone else. But I just make it mine, in like in 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 a way that I would have done it or I would do it. And it's really a complex process, and I'm lacking the words to describe it. And we should definitely have like a super long discussion and and a whole philosophy class on this. Uh, I I can't really give you more info than what yeah. I've said just now. That's cool though. That's interesting. I I'm realizing that when I was performing, you know, when I was on stage doing theater and acting, that was an outlet for a huge part of my personality that I had actually stuffed down when I was in grade school, yeah. being loud and obnoxious on the playground. And I also noticed that whenever I did improv in those acting classes, I would freeze up like nobody's business because it was actually forcing me to be myself in the present moment and just like letting it unfold however it would. But I couldn't do that because I was so scared of opening up and being authentic. Whereas I could just kind of hide myself, but still perform if you just gave me lines in a script and stage direction. I could do that, no problem. Yeah. You know? So that's really interesting. And now that I'm doing all this letting go work and the emotional stuff, I'm actually seeing more of that part of me, the silliness, right? Yeah. The, 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 um, the word is escaping me, the um, spontaneous, spontaneity, sp uh, being spontaneous, right? Yeah, um, I've seen this in I your videos, like you, you have yeah. this spark and uh, just a great timing to not yeah. make stuff like, you're not even saying it in a funny way, but just like the timing makes it funny or just even like a, a slight movement of the eyes and it just becomes hilarious. So I, I really enjoyed that. Yeah. Yeah, thank you, man. Yeah, I I think I think it's been it's been the most rewarding, beautiful thing to like release the resistance because the resistance is it, like you like you've heard it's not who you are, right? It's it doesn't have anything to do with who you actually are. You bring up that authenticity, and we're in desperate need for for that in this world. Yeah. No, definitely. Yeah. Definitely. I mean, uh, also to what what you said before, that it was hard for you to to display yourself or or let yourself go during improv. I had the same. So I created this persona um, that would like do all that stuff and and do all that artistic uh, things, and then channeled it through there. But then I also always wanted to be authentic, and then I would start these internal fights. And I would have these internal fights on stage. Um, it got to a point where it was so bad. Uh, I think it was my last uh, exam ever that I played um, in the conservatory. And it was like this super hard program. And, and I just got up on stage and I felt really confident that I will do it. And then I messed up like in the first seventh second, like the easiest thing from, it was not like, like the easiest, easiest, but like, Let's say it was mid difficulty level with just something dropping the hands over each other and was super easy and never, never made that mistake. And then from that point on, I, I did this mistake. I haven't forgiven myself. And then I was just like permanently fighting throughout the whole concert um, of this trying to be authentic, trying to connect with the audience, trying to um, experiment a little bit and then having this persona that is perfect and had prepared everything and is just like um, trying to catch all the horses uh, to go in the same direction but they sometimes wanted to go outside so it was um, really really exhausting mm -hmm. exhausting i haven't enjoyed it this was a performance that i didn't enjoy and after it um, i told myself i'm not going to do anything like this ever again because there's no point to it like, if I'm not enjoying it, I'm not going to do it. Mm. That, and it wasn't about the thing. It was about me. So yeah. that was uh, what needed change. That's interesting. What do you think about the 
the recordings of music or, or pieces that might be a little bit more messy or rugged, but there's so, there's so much obvious authenticity and emotion put into them that you can, you can't deny how beautiful and, and just awe inspiring they are. Do you know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, yeah. I, I, I think way, way better than that. I, I really think that's the purpose of it all. Like we have, yeah. In, in the whole music industry, we we gotten to this, I call it illness, because everything needs to be mixed down and, and perfectly produced and no mistakes and whatever. Everything is like super clean until the last detail, um, to which it makes sound robotic, inhuman. It's really not fun. It's really not fun. So I actually, behind this screen, um, there's an organ, a digital instrument that I've been building. And it's built on software instruments that people have recorded, like with the most expensive uh, microphones and stuff like that. So when I record on it, it sounds artificial. So I, w I had to find tricks how to make it sound natural. And the way to make it sound natural was just like record also the noise that I would do, for example, while playing. And you, you would hear a car going outside and then you would hear like the, the clacks of the keys and my breathing and and maybe the rustling of the clothes and and then I would just mix it into it so this was like dirt and suddenly it would sound really really natural so we are at a point I think um, where everything is becoming so artificial uh, that maybe it's now easier to say what matters if we uh, do these steps. Mm -hmm. Do you think that artificial intelligence is going to replace coaches and people who, you know, help other people? Most that, definitely not. You don't think so? No, I, I just think exactly to what we were talking before. I don't think there is anything um, that can give a human uh, that feeling of being heard of being understood, even if it's the most perfect AI crafting the most perfect responses, it's just like an online chat thing, for example. You you can't get the spirituality, yeah. you can't get the warmth, you can't get that which is ultimately really human. But it's a good question. What What is human? Oh, oh, we're going there. <laughs> I have no idea. <laughs> <laughs> That's what a do you think topic. about the what do you think about the AI and the and the coaches? It's it's a very interesting topic. Um I would say if you're not at least somewhat frightened by where we're headed with AI and like how it's going to change our lives, I think you you're just not paying attention enough to it. Not that I, I, I think we should be giving into fear or anything like that, but it's just going to so radically change everything that we do on a day to day basis. And it's going to. It's going to replace a lot of the jobs that we have. And I think I think, you know, businesses are going to try and stuff those pieces in in an effort to you know change their profits but as humans and as people you know who are social creatures it's going to probably have a lot of uh, negative impact on us socially spiritually emotionally so that's like really what i'm mostly concerned about is like if if we're not having that human face-to-face -face connection anymore because ai is replacing everything like think about how that's going to impact us emotionally like we well, our brain our brains can't AI, really tell uh, that, what do you think that ai would replace exactly uh because then maybe i'm not thinking of the same things as you are um i would i would say just communication between people and businesses um i do know that the the technology is changing rapidly it's improving rapidly and if you can get AI to replicate a nutritionist or a doctor or a coach well enough that answers 24 seven for you and doesn't require any payment. You basically have eliminated the services of that person because they can just be you 
without having to sleep. Even if you're not, even if you're not requiring, or even if, even if you feel like, well, that human impact, that face-to-face thing, that spiritual heart-to-heart, whatever connection is so important. If the money is not there and it doesn't make sense, then it's probably going to go away. It, I, I feel like there's the potential for that unless you can make that value clear and it makes sense. There's it's incentivized financially for us to still be coaches in person. I sure hope that's the case. You know, I want to coach people, Mm -hmm. but who knows, man? I don't know. It's very, it's very interesting where we're headed. I don't know. I'm, I'm not worried about that at all. Like I'm for sure certain that people are just going to go and look for the warmth. I mean, everything that you described, it's true, but uh, can you imagine like AI replacing a doctor? So you, you you go to a doctor with an illness and you need to get better. And actually what this person would also be supposed to give you, like I'm not saying all doctors are, but it's just like human connection and warmth and, and um, the acknowledgement that you are there uh, while AI, just yeah just fix you go home so definitely as you describe um this would be a very sad thing to have but people will need the human connection and we will still have a business of human connections in whatever way um i was thinking more of a of a different uh in in um a different kind of structure i don't know are you familiar like with the uh, levels of energy that Julian is talking about and the levels of energy of Frederick Dodson. So we have like the basic needs, right? That are, um, if you don't have them, you got fear, you got anger, you got frustration, desire, whatever. So you meet the basic needs and then you're like in the boredom type of thing. And then you maybe start exploring a little bit, right? So you get go into the 300s. That's the business kind of thing. Uh, if we look at the human history, we have like the agricultural revolution around 10,000 years ago. So this would just like getting the needs met and creating new jobs, like new opportunities. And this is where actually uh, new cultures, uh, like the big culture started to evolve. So we have uh, the Greeks, we have the Romans uh, that really built upon it before it, it's Egyptians and then Sumerians and uh, in China. Um, and I think India as well. But uh, n- never mind. I mean, you have then these civilizations that are starting to build up on this foundation of having the basic needs met. So the next would be like the businesses, right? Um, the production of stuff, this, this would be the 300s. And then we have the industrial age, uh, which just creates factories. Um, it creates machines that take away uh, manual labor, right? So people can start to focus on something else, which is knowledge which is in the 400s. So people started focusing on knowledge. And now we have AI taking over that. So what's left for us, right? So we can move into the arts. We can move into love. We can move into spirituality, which is in the 500s. So I think this is going to be the shift uh, of major things in the world. um, And hopefully we will be moving toward these things uh, because everything else below it is taken care of, right? Um, On the other hand, you could argue that we are only as strong as is the weakest link. And looking at our weakest links, we have still so many people in this world who haven't even have their basic needs met, right? Mm. Mm -hmm. I like that. So you're saying that we have an opportunity to expand and focus all of our energy on more creative endeavors become more spiritual because we are feeling more safe physically you know more of our needs are taken care of maybe hopefully those people who have those resources and who are further up can actually continue to work on bringing those people who haven't had their basic needs taken care of help to bring them up because ai is taking care of all the other grunt work i guess you could say yeah perfect I hope so. Yeah, I I hope so as well. I mean, we we can't tell for sure what's going to happen, but it would be a great, um, great perspective to have on the future. 
but obviously as you, as you've said also um the the part about fear uh let's just be realistic so looking at ai it's a tool and a tool you can use it for good you can use it for bad it's up to the society it's up to every individual to decide what they want to use it for and obviously the more higher we go the more powerful it gets so ai is really extremely powerful mm. and we're just at the beginnings right we're just yeah. starting to, to just start to, you know just like i every every once in a while i'm like oh i want to ask a question to chat to chat gbt and i'm like even just that i'm amazed at how quickly it spits things out just think like a year or two from now how accessible even crazier things are going to be now, for me I'm, I'm really happy about ai because i've always been more of a thinker and someone who does who creates ideas who creates concepts and i didn't like to do the dirty work you know so if i would create my own website then i would like conceptualize it and have all these great ideas but then i have to start and write it all down <laughs> But now it's super easy because I just tell ChatGPT what I want and what I need. And it's like my assistant. It's like the secretary that I never had. Just spits it all out. I just do a few corrections and it's mine. Mm -hmm. How great is that? Yeah. Yeah. Saves you so much time. What do you think about AI music? N not for me. Not for you? No. I mean, not for me. I, you can tell that it's it's just like so formulaic and there's no soul in it so maybe it'll improve but that's also opening up an entire can of worms where you can get an ai to like replicate a performer's voice and it'll just write the lyrics for it based on what this what songs they've written before like at what point at what are we going to completely eliminate the need for anyway whole other rabbit hole <laughs> I, I don't think it will ever happen and i think it has to do something a little bit with um just how digitalization works i think um also looking at the at the concepts uh, i mean we're coming back to the program time and time again but um like in the original transformation mastery uh program uh he talks about duality right and how you have night you have day and everything and it's like a perspective of seeing the world and it's not a perspective that's very useful if you want to move higher up so it's, it's just something also to let go of um and like everything that's digital works with duality you have just zeros and ones mm. and say okay yeah it's a very limited thing but from my experience as an artist i can really tell that you cannot capture a moment in any digital way like you you can what it does with audio it just takes like this wave and it slices it up into pieces the same it does with a picture you just not like i'm not seeing you i'm seeing pixels and i'm not hearing your voice i'm just like hearing slices now what we could say for example uh let's say for charisma you cannot really be charismatic over um the video like i could see maybe that you have certain traits of being charismatic and when you speak um that you behave as if you were charismatic but seeing you live would be very different you know because of the emotional impact yeah the I think there, there are a lot of more dimensions to it yeah uh-huh yeah i i believe what you're saying i i agree with you 100 percent. i just hope that most other people agree as well yeah. that's what i'll say they, they will they will come to it and i think it's also a little bit the time that will change and allow them to see it but also like just the work that we are doing so um what i didn't ask you but i i was really curious is um first have you seen julian live ever nope 
because it, it is really a different experience. Like he went into the room and he's like radiating, like th there's like sparks coming out of his skin. You know, if you're susceptible to that, you can really tell that this is a high vibration, high energy person that just entered the room and that it's, it's a very commanding presence. Um, but how did you then come across his products? How did you come across Transformation Mastery? Mm hmm. Yeah, I, I started seeing his videos pop up on my feed on YouTube mm -hmm. and Instagram. And I knew about him from his history with RSD. I never like went down that path uh, at any point. I've only recently gone back and like learned about his, his past um, in that space, which is quite <laughs> interesting. And yeah, I just, everything that he says completely resonated with me, especially his philosophy on anxiety, which to me at that time, I had never really thought about anxiety in that way. Up to that point, I thought it was mostly just mental and physical. Like I was studying the nervous system, yeah, right? And how, and how like digestion impacts the nervous system. And that's what causes anxiety. Well, not necessarily, right? What Julian says is like, anxiety is caused by the split between parts of you that are unacceptable and parts of you that are acceptable and that causes low self-esteem it makes it so you can't be yourself in public and then you're anxious about how you are integrated into social situations boom social anxiety right so that was like whoa that is like me to a t right now there's so much that i'm holding on to that's not serving and so um, I just continued to watch his work. When I saw that he was doing the coaching certification, I was like, oh man, this is like, this is a huge opportunity for me to get to like actually interact with him, to learn more about everything that he teaches and also how it will benefit me personally. And it's been the best investment that I've ever made in myself for self-improvement. Seriously, like it's been so rewarding in so many ways I couldn't have anticipated. Great stuff. But I'll second that. Yeah. So I'll, I'll say like, it's been especially helpful for me as a, as a coach for nutrition and people who are dealing with these nervous system conditions, because I see it from another perspective. Now, if you can change yourself mentally, if you can change yourself physically, if you can change yourself emotionally or energetically, like you have to change everything about you is being addressed from all different angles. So if there's something nagging in your life that you're not resolving or is, is, is holding you up, if you address all three of those pieces, you have to heal and you have to change. So I feel like I've, I've kind of come across the gold mine with all three of those things and I'll help them if they're working with me directly. So I, I feel like so, so blessed to have all that information at my disposal. Awesome. Awesome. I mean, I, I guess this is the way to go, you know, for me, it started also this way. Um, I really felt like I want to change and I completely resonated with what he was saying. Um, what I really resonated was, um, funnily enough, with the statement, you know, fuck everything, like fuck going to the gym, fuck if, if you don't want to do it, don't do it because I was pushing myself so hard. I was being extremely, um, uh, well, let's say goal focused. I, I sacrificed a lot of um, health, a lot of friendships, uh, many things just to get to a certain point in life where I wasn't really getting the results I wanted and just got into more dark place uh, the longer it got. And then uh, this was extremely liberating just to hear out of this frustration and just like, you know, if you don't want to do it, fuck it. Don't do it. Like, fuck going to the gym. I hate the gym. Fuck uh, going to, to whatever. Just if you don't should do anything. Just no, no shoulds, no, no whatever feels right. Do that. Go, go look into yourself. And um, that's somewhat where my journey started. Like from, from there, um, I took the path of, of looking really at the cause and not trying to 
change the environment or change my mindset and get more knowledge through books and get this new hack and get this new habit and stuff like that, but really just address and what's going on. Mm -hmm. That's cool, man. So you, you've kind of released your obligation to do things that you, you don't want to do. Like yeah, that's, it took me a while, you know, it took me a while. Like this started, this was the initial uh, spark, so to say, that was back in 2018. Um, and then this spark, and then I did his program for a while. And then I uh, worked with another coach for a while. And then um, I worked uh, with another method. Uh, I've been reading up on things and just became very... Uh, differentiated so it was just like this initial spark uh, for me that i also always uh, kept coming back to because it's at the foundation of everything i would say like th there's no more it doesn't get much deeper than that mm -hmm. isn't it interesting how everything that we do all of our behaviors can come back to us just searching for a feeling yeah right yeah. And so your your obligation to do something like going to the gym, you were probably searching for a feeling of what? I mean, you can tell me, but just feeling physically better or feeling proud of your physique or whatever, right? When you, yeah, you can like, just realize that feeling already, or you can let go of the things that are causing you to feel like you need that, getting in the mental story. Right? Yeah, I, mean, I just went to the gym because I had back pains because I would practice for so long sitting down that I would get back wow. pains and I couldn't <laughs> survive. Oh, yeah. Playing, so I needed to go to the gym and I hated it, you know. Uh, yeah. That's, that's it. How's your back feeling now? It's awesome. That's great. Cool. Yeah. Fuck the gym. <laughs> <laughs> I now sometimes go to the gym, but I, it's still not my favorite place to go to. Uh, I got to be honest. I do like exercise. I love it more and more uh, the older I get. But uh, gym is just not my place, man. I get it. I get it. <laughs> All right. Hey, Alex, it's been uh, great talking to you. I know that you have to leave very soon, but... Um, would you leave us with something maybe to summarize up or or maybe like your life philosophy mm. mm -hmm. life is life is so amazing i'm so enamored by everything that comes into our experience as conscious human beings and I would encourage people to surrender and embrace all parts of it, whether it, you know, it's, it's not feeling very good. You know, you're, you're dealing with an illness, you're feeling insecure, you're feeling anxious, or you're, you know, on a high, you're feeling really good. Just enjoy all of it. You've got to surrender to the waves of life and also take action, be resourceful and, as long as you're surrendering and taking action, I mean, you can create whatever you want in your own life. I've, I've seen it myself in my own life and in loads of other people that I interact with. You've just got to remove the resistance and take action at the same time. I think, yeah, and, and you can do whatever you want. Life is beautiful. Life That's is so beautiful. <laughs> hey, Alex, thanks so much. It's been a real privilege meeting you and talking to you. And we, we got to do this again. I mean, yeah. it's been a blast. Same here, man. Bless bless you for having me on. Thank you so much, man. Appreciate hey, you. Have a uh, wonderful day. Take care of yourself and uh, see you soon. See you, man. Take care.